guys, it's now Let's Reptiles. And sorry, I was trying to get into my Zen space because today I got to deal with those nasty little buggers that can kill me. And you really need to be in your Zen space for that. Um, I was, you know, trying to make a joke and I'm running out of ball jokes. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> before we get started, and I know people complain about this a little bit. So, if you're going to complain about me talking about some tools and some safety, just skip ahead a few minutes. Don't bitch at me for it, okay? I always do that when I do Venomous videos because I think it's an important thing to cover. One, all of our cages are locked. You can see you got these big lock bars on them, so nothing can open. Look at that. Nothing can open. Very important. That's secure. Two, you don't see them. Got my tools right here as well. So we are ready to roll. Now we're going to take all these locks off. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you wash out. We're going to cut the video, come back, and our safety bars will be off. We'll be ready to rock. And we're back. As you can see, the training wheels are off. So we're ready to go full dangerous mode. Uh, again, if you remember our last video, we had a smaller rack back here. This rack is something we switched to. A few of the reasons why I like it. One, bigger tubs. That's nice. Some of our steaks are getting pretty good size. Some of them didn't really fit those tubs very well. This gives them some more room, so I'm extremely happy we were able to make that switch to these clear windows on the front. This, first of all, is an Angolan, so I'll show you what I mean. Uh, not a venomous, but if you come look here, Kurt, you can see in there, actually it may be the angry ball, and you can see the snake in through the window. What I mean by angry ball is Angolan ball python cross. So you can kind of look in and see where some of your venomous stuff is, know what you're getting into before you open the tub. Really nice place to have. Is it perfect? No, it's not perfect. Is it an improvement? That it is. All right, uh, we're also going to be doing some watering while we're at it. So, first thing, right, first thing we're going to show is this cotton mouth right here. Now, cotton mouth, again, always want to use a hook. These can be a little bit testy. Cotton mouth, I already need to see we need water. So, I've been gone for Thanksgiving. I didn't get a chance to do as much work as I normally do. So, what we'll do is we'll fill this guy's water dish up. His tub looks pretty good, so we'll wait to do any full cleanings. These guys are native to Kansas. Most of what we have here is native to Kansas. Here's the kicker. Very, very, very rare. For those people who watch us and live here in the Manhattan area, you're going to say, I see those all the time in Pella Creek Lake, and I see them in the Pillsbury Crossing, and there's cotton mouths everywhere. There ain't no cotton mouths, okay? All you're seeing is Nerodi species. These are only found in extreme, extreme southeast Kansas. We also like to kind of just wet down all of the substrate because they're kind of like moisture and swampy areas. And I'll get you a look at them. And you're going to say, I've seen those in Kansas. Okay, you ready, Kurt? Get a look at this guy. Here he comes. Now these guys are known to be pretty defensive snakes, as you can see. He's taking a pretty normal cottonmouth stance. Uh, really dark colors, really pretty animals, really neat. They are there you go. Their name comes from whenever they open their mouth, like he just did out my face, it looks like a, a bunch of cotton in there, like a cotton plant, dark on the outsides and then white inside if I can get them to open that mouth again, take a defense posture when she's just going to strike at me. But they're only in extreme southeast Kansas, although they do look a lot like the Nerodi species that we see. Probably one of the most misidentified venomous snakes there are. But native to Kansas, just the same. Next will be a timber over here. This is a timber that is looking like he's about to start a shed cycle. This is one I've had since it was very, very young. And uh, it's grown quite well. He's actually puffing at me right now. His cage looks pretty good. We'll go through here. We'll water everybody. Hey, hey, hey. See, you got to read that. He started tracking on my hand, which I really didn't want him doing. So now he's good to go. He can be pretty flighty for a timber. There's that timber rattle. Over here, we just got a big tegu. <laughs> They've got him separated out for now, not a venomous snake. He'll be in there for a little bit. Come back over to another species native to Kansas, which is hanging out right here in the front. And that is our Massasagua. Get back in there. He's on the run. And here's the thing on these guys. I recommend them a lot for first-time venomous keepers. A lot of people disagree with me on that because of they're pretty pretty hot, but they're small with a small strike range, and I think that is kind of important on your first snake. So next up will be our copperhead. It's got some water. Again, these are probably the most common venomous species in the state. Have a wide range in the state of Kansas. Very pretty snakes. Very prone to biting. See, it's gonna be good today. So anyway, 
that is your copper head. We'll have, got to rotate, actually we'll move that over in a second, we'll work on this next row. Now we're going to get some of my westerns, just one of them. And it's still got a nice full water dish, as you can see. And this is the Caramel Albino Western. You can get to see her color. There it is. Very, very pretty snake. Very, very pretty. She's big, though, so you got to watch her. Big snake, big strike range. Now, speaking of crazy little snakes, this is one that I always like having the window on. Because if she's right up front, she's one i got to watch. She doesn't appear to be. She's in the back. That's our prairie. She can be one that jumps out pretty quick. There she comes. This is another little prairie. Which I'll be able to spray this one from here probably. One thing that just happened there is I sprayed a rattle. Not on purpose. But when you get the rattles wet, they don't make any sound. Now it went in the back and hid, so maybe we can get a little bit better look at it before you heard. Now she has a, or he, I'm not really sure yet, has a very nice distinction. This is the only one ever born here. And you can see how well it's grown. That was one of the little babies from that other prairie that we didn't know was grabbing when we got her. So live birth animals, really cool, really proud of that snake. We're going to just close that back up. I was able to use my hand because it's so far back. No danger there. Move on down a row. This is just a standard albino. You can see there's more rooms in these racks. This is really nice. Right there. Beautiful snake. Give him a hook back. I just love albino western diamond backs. So pretty. Close that one back up. Move over here. Ah, uh, this one <laughs> is a wild caught red. That's one of the blood diamonds. And you can just see how beautiful that animal is. It is not as red as the female at home. We just did the Thanksgiving video on. This is one of my two males. Really pretty. Really pretty. We'll keep on working our way down here. This is another western who's moved her water dish to the back. And I always like the water dishes to be right up front because it makes them much easier to fill. That one's got a lot of that lavender color in it. I just really dig that rattlesnake. Really dig it. A lot of water. One nice thing about these is they're a pretty deserty species. So they can go a long time without water. So even though I'm gone for a few days, some of the cages get low or to know that it's not going to be a problem for them unless I left it that way, which we obviously don't do. This one's still good. You can see this is another, make sure my hand's good, albino. Right there. Pretty snake. Pretty snake. But again, you got to watch these big old snakes because they do have, you know, they can reach out and touch them. They can certainly reach out and touch you. Move my water supply. Make sure it's going to hold there. All right, and I think we stopped there. This is another albino. You can see they're all slightly different colors, just from different lines. This one's got more what they'd call like a tangerine look to it. Really pretty animal. Still has good water, so we'll close it back up. That one is, this is a snake I know well. Okay. You, know, you guys hear me talk about the Blood Diamond Project a lot. This is obviously another red, another Blood Diamond. Here's the kicker. I always know this one. Here's why, because this is one I personally caught. You just saw him take off. Very, very jumpy little snake. He's actually a pretty good sized male. And the reason I know it's the one that I caught, because if you know the story on those Blood Diamonds, you know, make sure he doesn't come back out here to say hi to me. Uh, I caught one. And then buddies of mine that are local to the area I was in had caught the other ones and kept them. And I told them I wanted to work on breeding those eventually. They gave them to me so that I could try to do that project to prove if it's genetic. So all those came from the same area. That's been the story on those. Um, with that, this is the one that I know I caught. I know the other male was caught by a buddy of mine, and so was the female. So uh, actually Ty had that one, and a buddy of mine named uh, Todd, Ty and Todd. <laughs> had the female. How I recognize him is if you look back on that video, you'll notice he has a scar on his head. On half of it, there's an old burn scar. 
and the area where we were hunting had had a fire, like a wildfire go through it, and that was where I caught him in that area, and he had that burn scar on his head then. It was much more prominent. It's actually uh, faded a lot with him shedding over the time we've had him, but I can still see that burn scar, and I always know when I see that scar that that's the one that, that I caught, you know, me and my party that day when we were out looking. So I think that's pretty awesome. He kind of has a special place because of that. Another one that's moved this water dish. This is just a big old albino too. This thing is a massive western. Get some water in there before I... This one's deceptive because it'll act all chill if it doesn't care. But if you catch it in the wrong moment, it'll light you up. Okay. And as you look, I don't know if you can see that, Kurt. The whole time I was filling and I said it looks like it's really chill, you get back here to the head and it was watching everything and in the spot where it could go. But you can see it still has that lavender coloration to it. Just a beautiful, beautiful animal. Look at the size of the head on that thing. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous snake. That's not what I want to do. Come on. All right. Oh, one more. I forgot there's one more. I think we didn't do this guy way down here. No, we didn't. And I was wrong. The timber before, this is what happens when I don't look as close. This is the one that we've had since it was a baby. The other one's one that came from a trip to Oklahoma. So, you can see this was kind of a little fireball too. It's got a pretty decent poop in there, so we'll go ahead and get that one out. Alright, close that back up. And that's it guys, all I got left to do is lock this thing back up. That was a quick tour of our venomous rack. Uh, let me know what you think. I think it's a lot better rack than the old one we had. Uh, mostly because of just a little more room for some of the bigger snakes. Some of the smaller ones were fine than the other one. But some of these bigger ones, like this guy I didn't even have in the rack. He's so big, he was in a separate cage. He was just too big to go in there, so those are pushing that limit. So it's nice to have in a little more space. I also like the windows so I can see what I'm doing. And uh, this will be what we end up breeding our venomous in. What's not in our future zoo will stay in here and be bred. Any questions? Camera guy Kurt. Um, what do you dislike about this setup or where it's at? There's a couple things. Uh, one, you know, we're in a space confined area, so nothing's perfect. One of the things I hate is how close this wall is to my work area, which means when I go to grab a tub and open it, you know, I got to be really careful how I do it. I try to do it at an angle to clear this wall, and that could cause things to not move as quick or as smooth as I'd like, which could put you in a predicament if you're not careful letting the snake get out of the tub where you have to like use tongs and more hook work and just problems. Where these over here, I wish I had more room like that. That's one thing I don't like too. I wish these tubs all slid a little easier. That's something I, I don't much care for. There's some of them are a little bit stiff. We're going to go through and grease them. We've bent some of these to make it better. We've changed the heating element to try to make it better. Uh, but it still isn't as smooth as I would like. Two, the top of these racks is a metal grate. Can be banging on it. Nothing up here is venomous. So we had to go in and modify with this plastic to prevent fangs from popping through that metal grate and keep you from getting your fingers bit should your hand be right there. So we had to do that. I didn't much care for that, but it is definitely workable. So that, and then the other thing is too here, you know, I never use these top three for venomous because you're working at your eye level. And for me, anytime you're at the same level as your head, you're too high. It it's, becomes very hard to do good hook work in like this, it's just not feasible. These are just below my shoulder, if you can see. They're almost too high. I wish I only had to work from here down, but unfortunately in the tight space, you know, I've had to just decide that I can do this and be confident enough to do this. So. I have a couple up here and the one I never use. So I keep two up here. And you notice what I keep up here is a timber. They're not near as bitey as a big western. And I also keep a cotton now because it's not a very big snake. So it's things I, I have a little more space to work with versus or things that I'm very familiar working with versus putting like a big, huge western up here that's got a bad attitude. Just not a good spot for them. Or my prairie who jumps out the cage. I don't want her jumping out at my face. So, uh... There's, there's kind of that. That would be some of the things that I don't like. Just, you know, and again, nothing in the world is perfect. 
Is it workable? Yes. Is it perfect? <laughs> no, but that's what I've got. Any more questions, Kurt? Yeah, what's uh, one cool fact about uh, diamondback or rattlesnakes? One cool fact? You're going to limit me to one? Yes. Just just one? Yes. Oh, my God. This is like lace potato chips, Kurt. Nobody can eat just one. Uh, one cool fact. Oh, my goodness. There's so many. It's so hard to pick from. I, I guess I would say, for me, one of the coolest facts about them, and it's not even a science fact. It, it's a history fact. And that is that they are so connected to American history and they're something that is completely ours. You know, you go to India, they have the cobras and you have a lot of cool vipers and in like mambas in Africa and Asia and other places have all these cool snakes that they have and to me, you know, this is a quintessential North American badass snake, right? So this is ours. This is what is so unique to North America and to the United States. Not that there's not another com countries. You know, Mexico obviously has rattlesnakes. There's they they span up. They used to span up into Canada even. I don't know if there's any still found up there. If they are, it's very rare and it'd be usually your timbers. But they you know have adorned flags that are in our history for our first Navy flag. It's what you find that we took our emblem from for Olympus reptiles. Uh, ben Franklin wrote about them when he was writing as the American Guesser and talking about. Uh, comparing them to America and how they will give a warning before they strike, but if they, they keep their weapons hidden, but if they strike, they'll strike with deadly force. That's not the exact wording. You'd have to look up what exactly he wrote, but that's kind of the gist of it. And how he thought they symbolized what America was in that same way, that if you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. It's kind of not that way anymore, but it was then, and that, you know, we would tell you, hey, don't, don't mess with them, don't, don't tread on me, but when you chose to, if we had to unleash our weapons, we were going to unleash them with deadly force and not hold back. And even though we were small and unassuming, which at the time we were, we weren't a huge country going coast to coast, you know, we were this new thing forming that we still had the ability to, to take care and protect ourselves, very similar to a rattlesnake. So I, I think that's probably one of my favorite things is how uniquely American they are. When I say American, guys, talking North Americans, so don't get offended to me from the inside of the border. But this is our hemispheres, or our continents, quintessential viper that we have. So that's the one cool fact I'm sticking with today. I could give you about 30 more of why they're one of my favorites, but you know, every time I see them, I always, it always kind of comes to mind. All right, any more questions, Kurt? No. Nope. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Uh, you know what? I'll tell you what we're going to do. I just had this idea, okay? I don't know how I'm going to do it yet. But I guarantee you this, now we have this American talk, Kurt, don't forget, we're going to do a July 4th American special that involves rattlesnakes. We're going to do it. All right, guys, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.